Throughout the world, millions of young men and boys have high dreams of becoming a professional footballer. Many of these ambitious young players work extremely hard in hope of being recruited by heavily commercialised football clubs. An estimated of 1% of hopefuls actually make it as pro, earning six-figure salaries, while the remaining 99% wash through the system with nothing to fall back on but shattered dreams. Interviews will be held with ex-footballers and brothers Lloyd and Kelechi Opara. They share their perspective on a realistic life during and after football and having to start again with very little qualifications or experience off the pitch. They reveal the intensive training regimes, the highs and lows of having to adapt from the glitz and glamour of the football bubble to them being thrown back into what they describe as reality. You can't get away from the fact that a football club is a corporate entity in its own sense and the players are essentially their commodities and their assets. Okay? And uh, the remit of a football club, especially when you're obviously going through the youth system, um, and when, when you're looking to make that kind of um, jump up into the first team, is to become a player of some form of value. Yeah, I think I joined the uh, Coach United Football Academy at around 12, 13 years old. So what's happening at that point is you're typically going, you know, you're mixing your education with football. So you're studying, but then you might be going to a centre of excellence maybe once or twice a week. And you have to be dedicated because when you finish school, because at that time I was still in secondary school, so when you finish school, it's sort of like... Um, 3.30, 3.40, it's going home, packing your bags again and off out to go all the way to M4 Chase and you've got to remember that we lived in Tottenham, North London so you're talking 45, 50 minute uh, mm. bus ride and that meant we are getting home at something like half past nine in the evening. Because of where we were located, it just made sense for us to attend normal secondary school at our local area and then obviously um, travel down to Essex on a Friday to... to, um, to, to Play, oh, sorry, tra uh, travel down on Saturday to play games. But once we fully uh, joined the academy, uh, and once we became uh, YTSs, and we became full-time football players, then we had to attend in the first year, um, Catton College. Yeah. So we had to attend sort of like a private college, but it was just the footballers. Well, sometimes we actually had, um, we had tutors come into the club, so they would actually conduct lessons on the football club's premises. So yes, whilst they did facilitate education, the educational side, it wasn't something which they really, really um, thought about, in my opinion, and it wasn't something that they really pushed hard on. It was more about um, football comes first, mm -hmm. and education is very much second to that. A definite high for me, um, um, being in the academy was kind of that day-to-day, -day working with boys, enjoying it. But there are several lows in football as well. And I think the, uh, a lot of the lows go unspoken about uh, and sometimes even uh, hidden and, and it's that expectation. Mm -hmm. You know, people um, will expect you to perform, do well, succeed, progress and move on. And uh, not everybody can meet that expectation. I remember there were lots of times where, you know, where we had a lesson mm -hmm. and because I was with the first team, they would kind of lean to me and say, well, we're playing a big game in the weekend. Do you really need to go and attend that class? The first team needs you to run through certain patterns of play. Mm -hmm. And I always felt that I was being, there was, there was a pressure being applied to me to actually put football first. And even when you think about the subtle influences, like you say, someone asks you the question of, do you really need to attend that class when you know you have a football uh, uh, match coming up for the first team? I mean, they're still providing with the option, mm -hmm. but it's not really an option because mm -hmm. the way they're asking the question is almost like, well, you need to choose the, yeah. the football match yeah. instead of the um, instead of the, uh, the lesson of the class. However, you know, uh, one of the important things to remember is you still do have an option. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was uh, playing football and uh, over at Colchester, I could have easily done study at home. I didn't study at home. Mm. I didn't do put that uh, put that additional time in to try and sort of educate myself, mm -hmm. and I could have done that. Mm -hmm. But the only reason I didn't do that is because for me, I was always about football. A football club is going to look after the interests of a football club. They're not going to ultimately look after the interests of the individual, and that's for me where it is a very cutthroat type enterprise or, or, or business because there are a lot of young boys that are going into this industry with a lot of aspirations and expectations in terms of what it is that they want to try and achieve in the game. 
um, and you know there are lots of different um, influences and facets that are kind of considered um, from an educational standpoint, from a psychological well-being standpoint, that are put in place to ensure that these players have that support. But ultimately, the football clubs are in the process of developing and building footballers. Um, so that's always going to be their agenda. I do believe that Mickey Cook was a very, very good coach in helping us mm -hmm. and instilling certain principles and, uh, and, and, and a moral value within us. You know, he was very firm and very strict, but he was also a football man. So whilst he taught us uh, certain things and certain life skills, um, football was still at the forefront of his mind. And so education was very much at the second part of it. If you want to be a teacher, if you want to be an academic, well then go to university or go to study at A-levels and go down that route because in this environment we're here to produce footballers. And that's what I felt it was, that was the overriding message. So um, after being able to educate myself and get the relevant qualifications needed, I, um, I was able to start working in schools. First of all, as a primary sort of uh, primary secondary school coordinator, and then I went through the motions to um, my current position as an executive vice principal for the Spencer Trust. This is my fourth year now, when you include the first year that I've done. Um, so at this moment in time, I juggle my time between uh, volunteering work, which I do with Mind Charity. Um, I also do some of my practice. I have one-on-one -on -one clients that I do in my own spare time to increase my portfolio and experience. Um, and I'm due to graduate from my counselling, coaching and mentoring degree. I'm looking at potentially enrolling on a postgraduate diploma course or a master's degree once I've finished, finished or graduated from my undergraduate.